Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at deformation and metamorphism of rocks. So in this video we're going to be thinking about what are the different types of faults and this is going to correspond to section 8.4 of your textbook. So when we're thinking about faults the first thing we have to do is we have to be able to describe our faults. So we can see in this model here we have a fracture surface which is this surface coming along here and along this fracture surface we have two blocks of rock which are moving relative to each other. We have the grey block over here on the left and the blue block over here on the right and we can see from this diagram that the blue block over here on the right has dropped down relative to this grey block on the left and so we know there is relative movement between these two blocks they're moving relative to each other and so we know this fracture surface would be classified as a fault so when we're discussing a fault the fracture surface itself is referred to as the fault plane and the fault plane is the surface along which the movement is occurring so we now need to look and think about how we can define the fault plane using measurements. So the first measurement that we can take of our fault plane is the dip of the fault plane, which essentially says, what's the angle of it? And we're taking the angle from an imaginary horizontal line. The imaginary horizontal line is obviously going to have a dip or an angle of zero. So that would mean that if the dip of our fault plane was 90 degrees, it would mean that our fault plane would essentially be vertical. Now, in this particular instance, this fault plane here has a dip or an angle of around 45 degrees. And so this is the first piece of evidence that we can you know, measure and collect about our fault plane. So we now know the angle of our fault plane. It's about 45 degrees. The next piece of information that we're going to look for is what's referred to as the dip direction. And so we're going to say, right, we have a layer of rock and this layer of rock is dipping down into the earth. It's angled into the earth. And the next thing we're going to think about is, is which direction is that layer of rock dipping into the earth? And to do this, we're going to use a compass. And so we know a compass, obviously, north, south, east and west. But what we're going to do is we're going to a we're going to apply a 360 degree circle to the compass. So when we're describing the direction in which the fault plane is dipping, which is referred to as the dip direction, we're going to give it a number code. So north would be 000, east would be 090, south would be 180, and west would be 270. And obviously, because it's a 360 degree circle, you can use all of the 360 degree increments in between to describe which direction your fault plane is dipping. Once again, that's our dip direction. And so we can actually see the dip direction. So if you imagine if we had a fault plane and we poured some water on the top of it, we would be able to look at the water running down the fault plane. We would say, right, the water is moving in that direction. So that is the direction in which our fault plane is dipping. Now, the other measurement that we can take of our fault plane is referred to as the strike. And the strike is actually 90 degrees to the dip direction. So in this particular instance, you can see the dip direction is coming down like so. But the strike is orientated at 90 degrees, so it's coming across the dip direction in this orientation. And so what the strike is going to tell us is it's going to tell us about the trend of our fault. So when we look at our fault plane, we're saying, right, our fault plane has an angle of about 45 degrees and it's dipping off to, let's say, the east. So it's going to have a dip direction of 0, 090. Zero. Now, the other piece of information we would like to know is we'd like to say, well, what's the general trend of our fault? Is it going approximately north-south? Is it going approximately east-west? Is it going northwest-southeast, for instance? And so we can get this information by using the strike. And as I said, the strike is going to be at 90 degrees to our dip direction. So when we're discussing our fault plane, we can essentially collect three pieces of evidence, the dip, the dip direction, and the strike of our fault plane. So when we're describing faults, we are going to describe how these blocks of rock move relative to each other. So in this first instance, you can see that this block of rock and this block of rock are moving relative to each other. So this fracture surface here, this fault plane, is going to be a fault. And we can see in this instance, these two blocks of rock are not changing their relative height. So the relative height of these two blocks is staying the same. 
However, what is, what is changing is that this block of rock is moving away from this block of rock. So it's moving along the strike of the fault plane. There's no vertical change, but there is a lateral change in the position of the blocks of rock relative to each other. And so this type of fault is going to be referred to as a strike slip fault because the slip, the movement, is occurring parallel to the strike of the fault. Now, in this instance, we can see that we have two blocks of rock once again, and we can see that this block on the right is dropping down relative to this block on the left. The most important thing to remember is that in this instance, this block on the right is dropping straight down the fault plane. So there's no movement with respect to strike. It's just dropping straight down the dip direction of our fault. So this is going to be referred to as a dip slip fault because the slip is occurring in the dip direction. Now, most faults will not be strike slip fault or dip slip faults. Most faults will have quite complicated uh, movement, um, well, directions of movement, should I say. So in this particular instance, you can see that once again, we have two blocks of rock. In this particular instance, this block of rock on the right is clearly being pushed up relative to this block on the left. At the same time this block of rock is being pushed up, it's also being pushed backwards relative to this block. So we have a combined movement. We have both strike slip movement occurring and dip slip movement occurring at the same time. And so this type of fault is going to be referred to as an oblique slip fault. And so these are our three main types of fault, strike slip, dip slip and oblique slip. And then what we can do is we can apply these different types of faults to the uh, to the different styles of faulting which we find in the earth. So when we're describing a fault we will describe it typically as having two parts. One part is referred to as the foot wall and one part is referred to as the hanging wall. And in case you're wondering where these come from these are old mining terms. So the hanging wall represents the block which is moving. OK, so that's very important to know. So the hanging wall is the block which is going up or down relative to the foot wall block. So bear that in mind, please. So in this particular instance, we have a fault plane which is coming through right here. And this upper portion of our fault plane is being pushed up over the top of the lower portion of the fault. That would therefore make this portion of the fault, which is the part that's done the moving, the hanging wall, and this portion of the fault, the part that stayed stationary, is the foot wall. So when we look at faults, which are dip slip, so once again, going back to the previous slide, that's when the block of rock drops down or goes up along the dip direction, we can form one of two types of faults. The first type of dip slip fault we can form is called a normal fault. So in the case of a normal fault, the hanging wall will drop down relative to the foot wall. One more time, with a normal fault, the hanging wall drops down relative to the foot wall. And we form normal faults in areas where we have tension. So areas which are being extended, they're being stretched. And so we tend to find these faults forming in environments like rift valleys, where the crust is actively being thinned by the movement of tectonic plates away from each other. The other type of dip-slip faults that can form uh, are the result of the hanging wall being pushed up relative to the foot wall. And these are referred to as reverse or thrust faults. Now, we are thinking, well, hold on a second, why, can we why have we got two different terms for what is essentially the same type of movement? Well, it, it's all to do with the, dip or the, with the dip of the fault plane. So if your fault plane has a dip of 30 degrees or lower, we will refer to that fault as a thrust fault. If your fault has a dip of 30 degrees or greater, then your fault is going to be referred to as a reverse fault. But in both cases, reverse faults and thrust faults, the hanging wall is being pushed upwards relative to the foot wall. Now, in the case of a reverse and thrust fault, they form in environments where we have 
compressional tectonics going on. So this would be something like a convergent plate boundary where we have two pieces of crust smashing into each other, creating large amounts of compressional forces. So why are we, you know, why do we have these two types of faults forming? Well, we've discussed how the tectonic forces can cause the rocks to break, so that's not really anything particularly complicated. But the thing to the thing the thing to notice is that by forming a normal fault, what we're actually doing is we are increasing the length of our block of rock. So we can see in this case we used to have a block of rock that took up a space approximately like so. Now, this block of rock is being stretched, but rock isn't really flexible. It will tend to behave in a relatively brittle fashion. And so when we start stretching our piece of rock, it will break, but we still have to accommodate the, we still have to accommodate the movement. And so we do this by allowing this hanging wall block to drop down relative to the foot wall block. And by allowing this block to drop down, we make this total block of rock longer. So if you remember, originally our block of rock would have probably had its edge somewhere around here. But by allowing this block to drop down, we pushed this edge further out. And so the, the total length of our block of rock has been increased. So we have managed to accommodate the tensional forces, the extension. Now, in the case of a reverse fault, we have the opposite situation occurring. We have a block of rock which is being actively compressed. And so once again, this compression has exceeded the strength of the rock, so the rock has failed, it's fractured. And in this case, what's happened is the hanging wall is getting pushed up over the top of the foot wall. And so this allows our block of rock to become shorter. So it's essentially becoming, uh, it's decreasing in length. So once again, in the original situation, our block of rock would have taken up a space like so. Okay, so it would have been longer. But by pushing the, the hanging wall block up relative to the foot wall, what we've done is we've taken our block of rock and we've now made it shorter. It only goes from here to here. And so in this instance, by forming a reverse fault or a thrust fault, we've managed to accommodate the compressive forces. So by allowing these pieces of rock to move relative to each other, we are accommodating the tectonic stresses which are being imparted into the rock. So the next thing we need to think about are strike-slip faults. Now, in the case of strike-slip faults, the fault movement is exclusively along strike. There's no dip-slip movement. So the pieces of rock aren't going up or down relative to each other. They're simply sliding past each other and there is no relative change in height. So these, uh, this strike-slip movement is commonly going to be associated with transform plate boundaries and a type of fault which we refer to as a strike-slip fault. So you can see here, here's our strike-slip fault. The fault plane is here. It's this thick grey line. And you can see we have a block of rock over here on the left and a block of rock over here on the right. And you can see that the blocks of rock are moving relative to each other. Okay. And we have the same thing happening over here. In this case, we have one block here, one block here, and you can see once again, them moving relative to each other. Now, you will notice that these two different, uh, these two uh, blocks are given different terms. This one's referred to as a left lateral strike slip fault, and this one is referred to as a right lateral strike slip fault. So you're thinking to yourself, okay, what's the difference? Well, in terms of the fault movement, they're exactly the same. The blocks are simply moving past each other. There's no relative change in height. However, in this particular instance, in the left lateral fault, we have the block on the opposite side moves to the left. And so the opposite side is going to be represented by this block here. In the case of the right lateral strike slip fault, the opposite block is moving to the right, so it's coming up in this direction. So you're thinking, hold on, that doesn't make any sense. How can I actually work out which one is a you know, right lateral and which one is a left lateral strike slip fault? So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to make two fists and you're going to put your fists next to each other with your thumbs touching. So your, your hands are right next to each other. So we're going to look at the left lateral strike slip fault first, and we're going to use our hands to represent the movement of the pieces of rock. So if we're representing the left lateral strike slip fault, we're going to move our hands as if they were pieces of rock. So your left hand is going to move towards you and your right hand is going to move away from you. 
Now, the hand that moves towards you is going to be the hand that we use to classify our fault. So in the case of the left lateral fault, your left hand moves towards you, and so we're going to classify the fault as a left lateral fault. In the case of the right lateral fault, you'll notice what would be your left hand will be moving away from you, and your right hand will be moving towards you. This therefore tells us that this fault is going to be a right lateral strike slip fault. So once again, there are you know two general types of faults, strike slip faults and dip slip faults. For the dip slip faults, we have three different types. We have normal faults, reverse faults, and thrust faults. And for strike slip faults, we only really have two types of strike slip fault, left lateral and right lateral. All right, thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.